Good evening. Please forgive my melancholy visage. I cannot stop thinking of the Kalau Papa leper colony. Perhaps some of you may have heard of it. A more cheerless place would be difficult to find. I eagerly joined the medical profession as a very young man because I believed I was living in an age where anything was possible. Germ theory had changed everything we had ever known and suddenly diseases that had been a death sentence were curable. It seemed to me that the march of progress was unstoppable. Yet nothing inspired me quite so much as imagining an end to the unbelievable suffering of a small group of outcasts, people who were separated from their families and friends and condemned to live in seclusion as monsters, lepers. My name is Dr. William L. Moore, and I had devoted my life to the treatment of leprosy in Hawaii. Perhaps I should start with talk of happier, more innocent times before I ruin the merriment of your evening. As I said, I was a plucky and enthusiastic young lad. I cannot remember a time when I did not want to become a physician. I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1863 and immediately began to dream of making the world a better place. By the time I graduated with my medical degree from the University of Michigan in 1890, I was I had established myself as such an essential asset that the university quickly appointed me as an instructor, a position I held for three years. Why leave then, you may ask? I was in the perfect place to enlighten young minds and conduct crucial research. I'm afraid these islands got under my skin, as so often the case. While well, many others who came to Hawaii and came infatuated with the islands eventually joined the Comeback Club, my experience was somewhat different. When I arrived in Honolulu on a brief leave of absence from the university, I had so pleasant a time in the islands that I never went back. Besides casting my residential lot with Hawaii, I also chose my life partner here. I married my second wife, Miss Nell Lowry, sister of Frederick J. Lowry, president of Lewis & Cook Limited in 1899. We were blessed with three beautiful daughters over the course of the next decade. In 1893, I was granted a license to practice medicine from the Hawaiian Board of Health and started my first practice on Hilo on the second floor of the offices of Mr. D.H. Hitchcock. He was the father of my first wife, Almeida, who died at a tragically young age. I marketed myself as an aurist and oculist, specializing in the treatment of the eyes and ears. Not the height of my medical ambition, but it was a start. Over the next several years, I proved my mettle and was elected to many illustrious positions, including Hilo's uh, government position and superintendent of Hilo Hospital. In 1901, I relocated to Honolulu, where I served as a member of the board of the Hawaii Medical Society, and even acting city physician uh, during some of Dr. Archibald Sinclair's sojourns overseas. In all this work, I encountered many diseases, some terrible beyond belief. I fought the swollen pustules of the bubonic plague in the Kona district, was appointed medical examiner of public schools in Honolulu, saving the sight of children suffering trachoma, and even encountered the great white plague, tuberculosis, researching alongside the likes of Dr. Sinclair. No disease, however, fascinated, horrified me more so than that of leprosy. The great importance of the nature and mode of extension of leprosy is evident in the steady increase in countries into which it has been introduced. In the Sandwich Islands, for instance, leprosy was unknown in the early part of the 19th century and at the height of my research, a tenth of the population were lepers. In Honolulu at one time, there were no fewer than 250 cases and as of October 1890, Molokai settlement was home to some 1,154 lepers. In all the evidence I was able to obtain, leprosy in the Hawaiian Islands was unknown until recent decades. The natives called it Mai Pake, or Chinese disease. No one really understood the disease. I've often heard laymen attribute the disease to the rotting and falling away of limbs, but that is mere folklore. In reality, leprosy is a chronic infection causing inflammation of the nerves, respiratory tract, eyes, and skin. Though I do suppose it is possible that it can cause a lack of ability to feel pain, and there is a greater likelihood of loss of limb due to injury. However, most of these symptoms do not manifest for a great deal of time, and therein lies the true danger. 
the impossibility of detecting leprosy in its early stages is one of the greatest threats to the Hawaiian people. We must bear in mind that the duration of the disease is far greater than that is generally supposed. Patients usually take no account of the prolonged incubation stage marked with unspecific symptoms and temporary affections of the skin. Physicians themselves often overlook these symptoms. It is nearly impossible to form a diagnosis within the first stages. The whole period of the disease from onset to the time when noticeable signs are apparent accounts to three to four years. There has been many debate as to when the first case of leprosy was discovered in the Hawaiian Islands. Some point to cases as early as the 1820s, while others contend that the first case was discovered in 1859. In either case, it wasn't until 30 years later that the disease reached epidemic proportions. But what can account for this appalling spread of the scourge of humanity in such a short period of time? There are many theories floating around in the 19th century, but the most prominent source of blame among physicians was the very promised salvation from disease, smallpox vaccination. After the horrifying smallpox epidemic of 1853, when 6,000 people died, the pox returned to Hawaii again in 1868. In that year, a, a general vaccination took place. Doctors used spring lancets as their vaccination instrument, which are difficult, if not impossible, to disinfect. General arm-to-arm -arm vaccination seemed to coincide with the development of leprosy. Though there is no mistake as to the actual connection between leprosy and, and vaccination, many mistake is possible as to the real casual connection between the two. In 1865, King Kamehameha V, under pressure from foreign residents, urged the legislature to pass a law that strengthened the Board of Health, granting its members total authority to treat the disease, even if it meant forcibly inspecting and even arresting alleged lepers. Segregation became the chief, the, the chief treatment, and, and they the board purchased 800 acres of land on the isolated peninsula of Palau Papa on the island of Molokai for those in an advanced state of the disease. Lepers were shipped off in droves to these newly formed leper colonies. State-of-the-art facilities, including the Kalihi Hospital and Detention Station outside of Honolulu, and the Leprosy Investigation Station on Molokai were built to treat exiled lepers. The experiment of segregation coupled as it was with the enforced separation of families and friends amongst the people that were very gregarious and affectionate was met with great difficulty. I shall never forget my first visit to the suspect hospital where suspected lepers were monitored and eventually diagnosed. The climate of fear was stifling. Men and women hid under their beds and cowered in corners lest they be discovered and deemed leprous. A great number of patients were taken to the King's Wharf that day and forcibly deported to the living grave of Kalao Papa from whence no traveler returned. The scene was of the most painful description. These poor, afflicted creatures were torn from their families, husbands from wives, children from their parents, frantic with uncontrollable grief. Lovers were separated, their lips quivering amidst unaudible wailings and wringing hands in the agony of despair and other heartbreaking experiences that I shall never forget. Lepers have always faced an overwhelming social stigma. In India, up until 1815, lepers were punished by being buried alive. Though nothing of that sort ever happened in Hawaii, leprous Hawaiians faced unbelievable hardships. Patients of the Kalihi Hospital and inspection stations were more akin to convicts than patients. Now, great fences were built around facilities to keep lepers from escaping into Honolulu or attacking the station within the facilities. Even medical practitioners were trained in self-defense. The government began to convey leprous Hawaiians as licentious savages who had no control of their actions. Even the very language used to discuss patients was derogatory. Those who were free of disease were labeled clean, while those who were thought to be infected were suspect. Naturally, the Hawaiian people did not take kindly to these measures. 
They bitterly opposed segregation and, in many instances, lepers and their families took up arms to oppose the officers sent to arrest them. The countless patients refused treatment for fear of being the subjects of experiments, and it was thought that 3% of the population were hidden lepers. To add to the controversy, Hawaii saw little decrease of the disease, even as segregation was thoroughly funded by the government and supported by public opinion. We must treat lepers as victims, not criminals. I mean, what if the Board of Health regarded tuberculosis with the same disgusting stigma? I mean, what would the consequences be if every husband, wife, and child who developed a slight cough attended with weakness were suddenly and forcibly conveyed from their families with no chance of ever joining them? I mean, imagine the evasion, concealment, and subterfuge that would be practiced, let alone the difficulty, if not impossibility, of finding a law that would be actually effective. No. Instead of segregation, we must focus our efforts on the, the treatment and prevention of the disease. In my experiments with Drs. Edward Arning and Dr. Walter Brinkerhoff, I have found tuberculin to be a promising treatment, as it shares many basic compounds with tuberculosis. In Hawaii, patients preferred the Goto remedy, which included bathing in hot vapor baths, sand and mud. Another popular treatment was the injection of nastin, which is a fatty principle extracted from leprous lesions. Though these treatments showed promise, no one of them was the clean-cut cure we so desperately searched for. I died, never finding that cure. I passed away on October 21st, 1916, from a prolonged infection of the lung. What kind of physician am I? Not only did I not save the lepers, but I too died of disease at a very young age. Though the fact that you have come to visit me suggests that my efforts have meant something. I shall leave you with this. Look to the sanitation of the islands. A great number of diseases can be prevented with plentiful food, good clothing, and dry and secure lodging. Leper asylums are good and charitable, but they will not prevent or cure leprosy. Most importantly, we must undergo a major paradigm shift in how we perceive leprosy patients. They are not slovenly beasts who are inflicted with its disease in response to their sinful nature. I've spent a great deal of time talking with these people, comforting them, and even breaking bread with them. They are a kind, intelligent, and moral people. And until we treat them as such, their trust will be impossible to gain. We must all work together harmoniously for the one good end, to contain this dreadful disease to its closest limits and to help and support the poor afflicted ones to the best of our will and skill. Thank you, my friends. My spirits have been lifted by talking with you this evening. I still believe that the potential for curing leprosy is in Hawaii. Perhaps one of you will be the ones to find it. Good night. Godspeed.